Guys, go ahead and grab a seat. Welcome. How is everyone today? Awesome. Well, it's so great to see you. If we haven't met yet, my name is Pastor Greg Hintz. On behalf of myself and our leadership team, we just want you to know thank you. Thank you for being here. We know you could be anywhere in the whole wide world, and yet you chose this morning to be here on a morning where, you know, it's a Memorial Day weekend, it's graduation, we got all this stuff going on, but you said, man, Jesus is going to be first today, man. Jesus is going to be first today. So excited to have you here. It's been an incredible week for us. Last week, just want to give you a little update. We had water baptisms and it was really exciting. I want to just give you a quick little testimony of what happened after second service. So we're getting ready to do water baptisms. Our very own Danielle got baptized, our social media guru. Give it up for Danielle. She's around here somewhere. She's going to be in the back taking photos. So if you want to go back there and zoink, pow, boom, uh, she's going to be the person to take your picture with that backdrop back there. But someone came up to me last week right after the service, and they were just beaming. I mean, just filled with joy. And, and I looked at them. I said, hey, how's it going? And they're like, I've never been to church before. I said, you've never been to this church? She said, no, I've never been to a church before, and I gave my life to Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah, right? I mean, that's, that's awesome. And then, and then she said, and I want to be water baptized. And I remember looking and being like, well, that's not exactly how, okay. <laughs> so we had last week someone who had never been to church before, came to church, gave their life to Jesus, was, was beaming. I mean, just so filled with the Spirit of God that you could see it and got water baptized last week after the second service. That's part of what you're doing here, being part of the place church. You're making a difference. We declare it every single week, and I want you to know that you're not able to see every moment like that. But I'm going to tell you, every single week, I have testimony after testimony after testimony. I met with a, a lady last week, and she was sharing her testimony that she knew nothing about Jesus, wanted nothing to do with Jesus at all, and, and somehow came across our path. We ended up doing a home visit, Pastor Rex and I, and just spent time with her, which was the domino that knocked it over to begin to bring her to the place where I looked her dead in the eyes last week and she gave me this incredible testimony. I'm not even gonna share. It's her testimony to give. I'm not gonna share. I'm just gonna tell you it's one of the most beautiful things that I ever heard. I almost had tears in my eyes as she's sharing this. But the one part that, that she knew without a shadow of doubt, she said, I never knew Jesus, but I knew without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was with me and that Jesus loved me. She came from the place of not knowing just stumbling across somebody here in this congregation, right? And they made a phone call, said, hey, will you come visit? Absolutely, let's go visit, right? And that domino began this incredible journey where now she knows Jesus. You are making a difference. And you may feel like, hey, I'm just here, right? I'm just here to receive. I'm just here to get, no, your prayers, your presence, your giving, all of that helps make this a reality. And I gotta be honest with you, I really feel in, in my heart and my spirit that we're just getting started. I think we're just getting going. I think it's just, some of you guys got scared. I sensed it. I felt it. They're like, I'm comfy right now. I like things just the way they are. No, 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 no. We're just getting started. God is going to use each and every single one of you inside of this community and the surrounding areas to make a difference. He's preparing you. He's preparing you right now. In fact, that's what we're going to talk about today in the end of our Wonder Women, Woman, Women series. That's kind of a tongue twister there. The Wonder Women series, not Wonder Woman, because there's lots of Wonder Women, right? Wonder Women series. We're going to be looking at this one word, and this one word is simply this. This one word is purpose. Purpose. Now, I want to ask you a question. I'm going to give you the opportunity to actually answer. The question is simply this. When I say purpose, what comes to your mind? When I say the word purpose, what comes to your mind? Reason. Good. What else? A goal. Good. What else? Dedication. What else? Legacy. Direction. Two more? Objective and? 
Meaning, awesome. Meaning and focus, I love it. All those are great examples of, uh, of purpose. And here's one thing that I want to let you know, that God cares about purpose and that God has a purpose for each and every single one of you. Individually, in your life, he has a purpose. And it's not a purpose that's over. You're like, yeah, I had a purpose back in 73, but those days are long gone, right? <laughs> No, he has a purpose today for your life right where you are. And I see it over and over and over again throughout scripture. In fact, if you spend any amount of time with me that you would know my life verse, the verse I hold on to white knuckled, I will not let it go. It's a verse that has held me through many difficult moments. And maybe it's a verse that can hold you through some difficult times too. It's the book of Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. It says this, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Notice I didn't have to peek to see it. I know it because it's hidden in my heart. I know it because it's carried me through difficulty. It's a message that says God can use me in spite of me, that he has a purpose for my life, that his purpose is not to harm me, but to prosper me, to do good things through my life. That's his call for me, and that's his call for you. But that's not the only verse that talks about purpose. In fact, if I were to go, and this I know for some of you is your life verse, Proverbs chapter 3. Verses five and six says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. You know, think about that. What God is saying is that if you'll acknowledge him, if you'll open up, if you'll let him be part of your journey, if you'll let him be part of your path, and you got a choice. You got a choice whether you're gonna let him in or not. I always say God's a gentleman. He's not gonna kick open the, the door of your heart, right? I just did that for my video guy because he's gonna do something crazy with that later. I promise you that's, that's gonna happen. But he, he's not just gonna kick open your life, right? He's just sitting there, knock, 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 knock. And he's waiting. What's he waiting for? He's waiting for that moment where you'll, where you'll open that door and you'll say, yes, God, I, I wanna live life with you. I, I wanna invite you into every part of my life. Yeah, the great parts, the parts I do really good, but also the areas where I'm not doing so hot. Those are areas where I keep failing. I'm, I wanna invite you into those areas too. And he says, the moment that you do that, he's gonna begin to intervene in your life. He's gonna begin to make your paths straight. In other words, he's going to take an interest in your journey, in your trail, in your path, and he's going to begin to arrange it and move it and make it the way that it is. The question is not, can he? The question is, will you let him? Will you allow him to be part of your journey? And then if we were going to go into the New Testament, we would see the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, that says this. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works, right? Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I love this verse because what this verse tells me is that God has a plan for my life. God has an agenda. He has a direction. He has something that he wants me to fulfill, that he has some good works for me to do. Now, I don't have to do good works to earn God's love. I do it because of his love, because he's poured grace into my life. I step up to the plate and I say, God, I'm yours. I've enlisted. I'm a soldier of the most high. Amen. Amen. I'm all his. I'm a bond servant of God. I'm just going to follow him and serve him and give him everything that I have. So he has a job for me, but this is the part that we miss sometimes, which he has already prepared. He already knows. We get worried. We say, God, how can I do what you've called me to do? Listen, God wouldn't bring you to it if he didn't know that you could do it. Amen. God wouldn't bring you to it unless he's already put what you need on the inside of you to accomplish that, which he's called you to do. So we hold on to that. See, today in our final woman that we want to look at in this series, I want to look at a woman by the name of Esther. Esther. 
Esther's an incredible woman. In fact, she's got an entire book named after her in the Old Testament. You can read about Esther's story, and I would encourage you to do that this week. It's only a few chapters long. But to give you just a little bit of the backstory of Esther and who Esther was, if we picked up the time where she was, she actually lived in the fifth century. So in the years 400 and change, right? And so here she was, 496, some say 476, whatever. But she was a Jewish queen in the Persian Empire. Uh, let me tell you, those two things don't go together very well. Jewish queen in the Persian Empire. Ah, didn't really work out, right? Now, I think she got the job because they didn't know she was Jewish, right? And she's actually got this incredible story. And unfortunately, I don't have time to unpack everything for you today. So what I want to do just in, these, in, in, these, just in a couple moments, I want you to look just to get the backstory of Esther as we dive in head first. Go, go ahead and check this out. Esther was a young Jewish woman. She was born into a broken family. She was a minority in an oppressive society. The odds were against her right from the start. But almost overnight, Esther went from rags to riches, from poverty to the palace, and she became the wife of King Xerxes I, making her one of the most powerful women in history. Irony seems to fill the pages of the Book of Esther. Just as Persia has unknowingly crowned a Jewish queen, the king's visor, a man named Haman, is plotting a diabolical scheme to exterminate the Jewish race through a bloody massacre. massacre, 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 massacre. There is only one Jew in the land who is in a position to intervene on behalf of her people. It's Esther. But it seems as though the pleasures of the palace had begun to intoxicate her. She begins to struggle with what course of action to take. As Esther looked around at the beautiful palace that was now her home, with its luxuries, pleasures, conveniences, and the wealth she had come to enjoy, it must have been difficult for her to imagine throwing it all away in some misguided attempt at heroism. She knew that taking this matter to the king would force her to risk everything she had including her very life. Perhaps a more subtle approach would be best. Maybe she should just lie low for a while and wait to see how things would play out. Perhaps at some point she would have an opportunity to put in a good word for the Jews without jeopardizing herself. After all, what good would she be to anyone if she were dead? dead, dead. But Mordecai, Esther's cousin, sensing her internal struggle, sent her this message. Do not flatter yourself that you shall escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from elsewhere. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows but that you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Quite a powerful story, isn't it? You know, when you think about Esther's story, there's this moment where Mordecai comes to Esther and tells Esther, listen, if you don't intervene, we have our faith in, in God. God's got this. He will somehow rescue the Jewish people. But maybe Esther all of the good things, everything that you, all these open doors of opportunity, all the great things that have been bestowed upon you and have been blessed upon you, maybe it's all happened for such a time as this. Maybe it's all happened for this moment right here. See, I, I want you to think about your life, though, for a minute. I want you to think about your life and I want you to think about it through the lens of these words right here for such a time as this. Because I believe for each and every single one of us, we're here today 
for such a time as this. You see, God is calling you to something today. And sometimes in our life, though, we, we come to the place where we look to God and we say, God, how on earth could you use someone like me? And sometimes we're actually not looking at our lives today. We're looking through the lens of the mistakes that we've made, of the wrong turns that we've gone. And we say, God, how on earth could you use a person like me? Or maybe sometimes we're looking at our life through the lens of the victories that we had. And we find ourselves in this place where we're puffed up and we're looking at our lives like, well, look at all that I've been able to accomplish. Look at all that I've been able to do. Or some may look at their life through the lens of age. And so you look at the place where you are and say, well, I'm kind of past my prime. I've, I've done that. I look back and I remember, but not this time. It was more for such a time as that. And I think the reason that we do that a lot of times is because we're only viewing our life through our own lens, through our own perspective, that we're only seeing it like this and we're only looking down at ourselves in this place where we find ourselves. And we have to realize, though, that God has an incredibly different view of your life. Amen? God's not viewing your life just through today. He doesn't view you like that. Do you know God views your life through the lens of eternity? That he just doesn't view today, but he sees the whole picture. That's why he's so stinking patient with you. Right? I mean, if he just saw you through today, he would have zapped you a long time ago. Don't you think? (laughs) but he's not he's patient because he sees what can happen he sees the work that he's planning on doing he sees the the path that you're going down and and how he wants to use you on this earth and the change and different that's going to happen and so he sees you through this longer lens he sees you through this different perspective that's why on a regular basis i'm consistently praying this prayer over you god help them See them through your eyes. I want you to begin to see your life, not through your own past, not through your own letdowns, but I want you to see you through his eyes. Because when he looks at you, he sees his child. He sees his son and his daughter. Yes, a son and a daughter that's made some mistakes. A son and a daughter who's maybe fallen short in some areas. But he's looking at you with such a pride and such an excitement of who you are becoming and the work that he's doing on the inside of you. He is so excited. You're not done. Some of you may think that sickness has done you in. That sickness has put a period in your life. And I want you to know that sickness has not put a period in your life because God's going to turn that period into a comma and that's going to be part of your story. Amen? He's going to intervene in the midst of your life, even right now. And I don't know what he's going to do, but I know he's going to do something. For some, some that are sitting in this place right now, they've been touched with God's healing hand. That they found healing and strength in the name of God as God has moved on the inside of them. God moves like that. God God does. And guess who gets the, guess who gets the praises when God moves miraculously like that? He does. It's not us anymore. It's all about him. It's about putting our faith and our hope and our trust in him. For, so for some of you, that may be it. Listen, God looks at your life today and he says, for such a time as this, for such a time as right now, do you know God has a plan for your life right now, today, right where you are, right here in heaven on earth, Wickenburg, Arizona. Who would have thunk, right? That God has a plan for you right here, right now. In fact, some of you never even heard of a Wickenburg before, and now you're sitting in it. And you're looking around like, man, I'm in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> There's not even an in and out burger. What's up with this place, right? But you realize it's in this desert place that God has gotten a hold of you. And it's in this desert place that God is molding you and forming you and creating something new on the inside of you. See, when God looks and he speaks over your life, he says, for such a time as this. He doesn't look at you and say, for such a time as that. 
He doesn't look at you and say, you're only worth what you've been, what you've done in the past. He doesn't do that. He doesn't look at you and he doesn't say for such a time that will be. He's not looking at you at some, well, maybe someday he'll get there. Maybe someday she'll get it right. Maybe if I give her another 15, 16 years here, uh, maybe one day she'll, she'll serve me. Maybe one day she'll, she'll give it all up. He's not looking at you like that. He's looking at you and he's saying he wants to use you right now, right where you are, in all your brokenness, your mess and mistakes, even in those things that you can't get over, even in those hurdles that keep tripping you up, even in the struggles that you're having, even though your relationship is on the rocks, even though you can't get over that addiction, even though fill in the blank for your story. Every single thing that you use to try to justify your inaction, everything that you say back to God, saying, God, you can't use me because, whatever that thing is, you know what it is. I want you to know that he doesn't care about that. He cares about you and he cares about surrender. And he cares about you taking all of those things and whatever it is, whatever pride from the past or whatever, you know, unworthiness that you have that's only having you look to the future and surrendering all of that to him. And the crazy thing is, is that when we surrender it all to him, God intervenes. God enters into your mess. God enters into your life. And you look around and you start to think to yourself, God's using me. I didn't think it was possible but God's using me. If you surrender, God begins to use you. Amen? For such a time as this. Now let's get back to Esther's story. You know, the main characters in Esther's story, there's three of them. Of course, there's Esther. She's the queen. We already talked about her, a Jewish girl who became a queen. But there's also another guy. There's this guy by the name of Haman. We'll call him the grumpy elf. All right. He's a grumpy guy. He's not really happy. Now, Haman, he, he got promoted. He got this really cool promotion. And the promotion actually uh, included that the people would have to bow down when he walked past. And so he was super excited about this because Haman's kind of puffed up in and of himself. Like he thinks he's a big deal. So he's walking through the city gate one day and he looks and he sees this guy by the name of Mordecai. Now Mordecai refuses to bow down to Haman. Now I don't know what he had against Haman, but Mordecai, he didn't like Haman at all. And he said, I ain't bowing down before him. So somebody sees that. Somebody sees that Mordecai didn't bow down. And later on, this guy calls Haman off to the side. Said, Haman, come here. Do you see that Mordecai guy? He was like, I know. What's up with him? He's like, he, he ain't going to bow before you. So that guy goes to Mordecai and says, you need to bow before me. He said, I'm not bowing before him. So he goes back and tells Haman. He said, he ain't never going to bow before you. He don't like you at all. And so Haman gets ticked off at Mordecai. He said, man, I can't stand that Mordecai. He gets angry. And, and, and he takes it to a whole new level. Not only does he get mad at Mordecai, but his anger goes to Mordecai's people. And so he comes up with this plan. Haman's plan was he was going to get this edict passed, this law passed that was going to end up in the murder, not only of Mordecai, but the murder of every Jewish person. Could you imagine? I mean, Haman is taking his anger to a whole new level, right? And he gets the law passed. It goes through, right? Now, Mordecai is Esther's cousin. Esther is working. In, she's the queen, right? She is like in the castle. She is in the area. She is with the king on a regular basis. The cousin Mordecai gets with Esther and says, Esther, we got a problem. There's a law. This Haman guy He's going to kill every single Jew. And that was what we saw in the video. You know, this question, what, what am I going to do? I'm, I'm in, I have all this great things. I have all this opportunity, but, but still, if I do this, they're going to find out about me, that she may actually die, that she may be killed now because she's Jewish. And then Mordecai's like, look, God's going to move, but this may be your moment for such a time as this. And those words in Esther's life, they just kind of sunk in. And I don't know how long it took, but she was kind of wrestling with the reality that 
She was given this incredible opportunity as queen for such a time as this. So scripture tells us that she decides that she's going to request an audience with the king. This was unheard of. Just the very request. See, the queen was only allowed to show up if the king called the queen. It had been over like 30 days the king hadn't called the queen. So in Queen Esther's mind, she has fallen out of favor with the king. And so she makes this decision that she's going to go to the king, even though if anyone shows up before the king without the king asking, that person could die. They could be murdered. They could be killed. And so Esther goes and finds her cousin. And we can read it in Esther chapter 4, verses 15, 16, and 17. Here's what it says. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. So she's sending a message to Mordecai. Go gather all of the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then, then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Now, I want you to think about the courage of Esther. For her to even enter this, she could die, and she understands that. She knows it. She says, if I perish, I perish. But she ends up doing it. She, they fast for three days. She goes and goes to see the king, and the king grants her grace and favor. He's excited to see her. He says, oh, what's up? Come on in, honey. You know, that's my own version. That's not biblical, all right? And he said, what do you want? What do you want? And, and so Esther's like, listen, I want to throw you a feast. I want to throw you and Haman a feast. Come on, I'm going to cook it up, and you know I can make them chicken wings. It's going to be great, right? So let's do it. And so the king's like, sure, that sounds great. I love your cooking. Let's do this. We're going to have a feast. And so they have, they have the feast. And uh, the feast goes on and, and they eat. It's Haman and the king. And man, they're tearing it up. And the chicken wings are as good as they remembered. Life is good. And, uh, you know, the wine's flowing. They got the cerveza going. And uh, before you know it, right, the king's feeling a little inebriated. He's a little tipsy. And he's a happy drunk. So he's like, queen, oh, I love this food. It's great. It's awesome. I'll give you anything you want. Now, Esther's really smart here. She says, you know what I want? Here, here's what I want. I want you to come back tomorrow, and I'm going to make you another feast, and it's going to be great, and I want you to invite Haman back to that feast too. He was like, is that it? Absolutely, dear. And he goes home, and he tries to go to sleep. Now, the problem is, is that night, he couldn't sleep at all, right? He was tossing and turning, and he couldn't sleep. And so, because he couldn't get to sleep, he got up, and, and, and he decided that he was going to have the, the city records read to him, right? It was like what I do when I can't sleep. I read the rise and decline of the Western civilization. Works every time, all right? Um, so that's, I don't know what he was doing. Maybe he thought it was going to make him tired. But he goes and he has them begin to read these to him. Now, as they're reading, they get to the, this one part. And this one part talks about this guy who averted an attempt on the king's life. See, what happened is that this individual heard these people talking that they were going to try to assassinate the king. And so this person reported that, and those people that were plotting the assassination were taken out, and the king's life was spared. Now, the king's hearing these words, and he's like, oh, man, who is that guy? We didn't even do anything special. We didn't have a party. We didn't do anything. This guy averted, uh, you know, this, this assassination attempt. We need to honor this guy. The guy who averted the assassination attempt was Mordecai. So the king, right, he gets up in the morning, maybe gets a little bit of sleep, and he goes out and finds Haman. And he says, hey, he's excited. Haman, I'm just wondering, man, you know, you've been around for a little while. You got the promotion. Things are going good. Haman, I'm wondering, what do you think we should do for someone that we really want to honor? Now, Haman, 
He is so puffed up with himself, right? Haman is he's talking to him. He says, well, surely the king's asking me what he's going to do for me. And so he gives him the answer. He says, what we should do. We should go ahead. We should put some of your clothes on that person you want to honor. We should put that person on your horse. We should take that person around town and everywhere we go, we should announce how great the person on the horse is and that every people go to the person on the horse. Now, this is the funniest part. The Bible is hilarious, right? It's so hilarious. If you just, some people are like, the Bible is boring. I'm like, you are not reading the same Bible I am reading, all right? Because watch this. Haman is saying all this stuff to the king. And then there's this moment where the king was like, I love that idea, Haman. That's the best idea I've ever heard. Haman, I want you to go find Mordecai. <laughs> And everything you just said, I want you to do to Mordecai, right? I want you to take the clothes. I want you to put them on the horse. I want you to take them around town. I want you, think about that. I want you to tell everybody in the town that he is an awesome guy. And so he does. Haman does this, right? Can you imagine Haman? Yeah, you know, I'm just angry. But he's got a smile and just. And Mordecai doing, he's like, he's got his beauty wave on, right? He's on top of the horse saying hi to everybody. I don't know, but I think it's funny, right? It's funny that that worked out like that. And what ends up happening after this is they go back to the feast. This is the second feast, right? Esther's cooked up her food, but Esther, this time, she's going to lay it out. And she lays it out for the king, and she's like, king, Here's the reality. There's an edict out to kill all of the Jewish people, and I am a Jewish person. Now, the king loved the queen, and when he heard that, he got so upset. He got angry. Who would want to hurt you? Who would want to do this? And it was in that moment that Esther said, Haman. Oh, man. King's like, it's on like Donkey Kong, right? Like, he's... He's flipping over tables. He's, he's, he's irate, and he just disappears. He, like, leaves around. I don't know what he was doing, right? The Bible doesn't tell us, but he's just gone. Now, Haman's like, oh, man, it's not going to be good, right? And so Haman falls down at the feet of the queen. He's begging the queen. I don't know what this scene looked like, but it looked like something when the king came back in. He was like, oh, no, you didn't. Now you're going to assault my queen? Because that's what he thinks, right? And, and the queen has, has to, she's just standing there, right? Now what Haman had done the night before is he's created these gallows, these places where in his mind, Mordecai is going to hang and he's going to kill all of the Jewish people. But the problem is, is that when he's on his feet before the queen, the king comes in enraged. He yokes him up. The people take him out. And guess who gets a one-way trip to the gallows? Haman hung on the very gallows that he created to kill the Jewish people. But let me tell you the last little bit of the story. See, in Esther's story, the people, they were rescued. They were rescued that day. They were saved from death and they were saved from destruction that day. However, the real victory started long before that day. The real victory started the day a woman was crowned a queen and found purpose in her existence. The real victory started the day a woman was crowned a queen and found purpose in her existence. When I look out at each and every single one of you, I want you to know that I see royalty. I see people that God looks at as royalty. You don't believe me? That's scripture. It's what the Bible says about you. See, for some of us in our life, the problem isn't that God doesn't love us, doesn't care for us. The problem is that we don't even know it. It's not that we're dumb. We're just ignorant. 
right? We don't know. Did you know that in the Bible, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, but you are a chosen people, but you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that that's you. That's you. That's me. That's we. That's us. We are that holy people. We are the people belonging to God. We are the people who have purpose and destiny inside of our lives. Each and every single one of us, the moment that we open our heart and our life to Jesus and said, Jesus, I'm all in. We went from darkness to light and a crown, spiritual crown was placed on our head. And yet when we look at ourselves, we don't see that. We don't see purpose. We don't see royalty. Listen, maybe for some of us every day this week, maybe that's your declaration over your life. I am royalty. And you say, ah, I don't want to believe that. Well, then you're calling the Bible a liar. My Bible doesn't lie, right? You're royalty. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. You see the plan and purpose right there. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You want to know what your purpose is? It's right there. To declare praises of God wherever you are. Whether you're behind a guitar, behind a mic, behind a, a, a cashier, and you're checking people out, you are there to declare the goodness of God. I told you last week, the lady who changed my life was cooking corn dogs in a truck. Come on, somebody. You're not going to tell me she woke up in the morning and she said, bless God, I can't wait to make corn dogs, right? And maybe that's where you are in your life. Bless God. You, you, you can't. Maybe there's things in your life you're frustrated about. But when she got up in the morning, she said, bless God that I have another day to declare the praises of him who called me out of darkness into his wonderful light. And she realized the purpose of her life wasn't making corn dogs, but it was declaring the praises of God. And I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for her. Amen. Think about that. I love corn dogs. Who's... <laughs> Who's the pastor Greg in your life? Who's the person in your life that everybody else is looking after that maybe they just need a little encouragement? Maybe they just need a little bit of prayer. Maybe they just need someone to come next to them and encourage them and strengthen them. Maybe they just need someone to share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. Who's that person in your life? Because I believe for each and every single one of us, perhaps you were born for such a time as this. God has a plan, a purpose, and a call for you. The question isn't whether he does or not. The question is, will you open up and respond to his call? Let me pray for you. Bow your heads. Hallelujah, Father. I want to thank you so much for your word. I thank you so much for the book of Esther. I thank you for the testimony in there of a woman who faced difficulty and faced struggle and faced trial, but didn't leave, didn't collapse under the pressure, but rose to the occasion and declared, I surrender my life to God. And in that moment, she says, if I die, I die. It was a moment of surrender where she said, it's not about me anymore. God, this is all about you. And I pray, Father, for each and every single person that's here today, that we all can come to that place, that we all can reach the place where we realize that the breath inside of our lungs is there on purpose and for a reason, and that we're living on this earth because God has a plan and a purpose and a destiny, that we are here to be difference makers, that we are here to change this world. How do we change this world with that one person? with that one prayer, with that one time, with that one moment that each and every single one of us is given. And it starts when we begin and we take that very first step. Now for some here, you're longing for purpose. But for you, it's been all about you. It's been all about yourself. It's been all about your life. And God's looking at you and saying, are you ready to surrender? Are you ready to give it all over to me? And in this moment right now, you can do that right where you are. You can begin that journey. You can start that path. You can surrender your life to Jesus and say, Jesus, it's all yours. And you can do it right from your seat. If that's you and you say, you know what? I'm ready. I'm ready to surrender it all. I'm ready to give it all over. On the count of three, I'm going to have you do this. On the count of three, I just want you to lift your hand up and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. 
we're gonna say a prayer. It's a simple prayer of surrender. It's the beginning of your new life with Jesus and fulfilling the call that he has for you. It begins with this first step today. So if that's you and you know, there's a stirring on the inside of you right now. You know, God is calling you in the midst of this moment. On the count of three, I'm gonna have you lift your hand up. Ready? One, two, three. Lift your hand up high so I can see it. Anyone out there says yes to Jesus today. Hallelujah. All right. Father, I thank you right now that each and every single person here is following you. They've committed their lives to you. They made their decision. The line is in the sand. But I pray right now for them that they never live another day without, Father, the fullness of the understanding of why they're here. The understanding that they are here to be difference makers, that they are here to respond to you, to follow you. And when it comes to saying Will I go or won't I go? That they're going to be the people that say, God, I'll follow you wherever you lead me. My life, my todays, my tomorrows, they are all yours, God. Have your way. I pray that in Jesus' name. Everybody says, amen, amen.